Good afternoon, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session of Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And today we are going to be looking at the Ten Commandments in public school systems in the United States, particularly in the South. Um, the other day we learned that in Louisiana, in the state of Louisiana, the um, government, the governor rather, of Louisiana is about to promulgate, to promulgate rather a, a law which uh, allows the Ten Commandments to be put up in every classrooms within the public school system. So we have CNN here and suggest an article on CNN. Louisiana public schools are now required to display the Ten Commandments in all classrooms after Republican governor Jeff Landry signed the requirement into law on Wednesday. House Bill 71, approved by state lawmakers last month, mandates that a poster size display of the Ten Commandments with large, easily readable uh, font be in every classroom at schools that receive state funding from kindergarten through the university level. The legislation specifies the exact language that must be printed on the classroom displays and outlines that the text of the Ten Commandments must be the central focus of the poster or framed document. So before signing the bill, Land recalled it one of his favorites, and I quote, this is from Landry, Governor Landry of Louisiana. If you want to respect the rule of law, you gotta start from the original law given which was Moses. He got his commandments from God, Landry said. Now, this has provoked a lot of discussion, particularly among Seventh-day Adventists, but I'm sure among members of the political left, right? So the political left is having a field day, as it were, and freaking out about this law that was put into place that was actually promulgated by the state of Louisiana. It has not yet been passed, but if it is passed in the House of Representatives in Louisiana and also in the Senate, it will be effectuated shortly. Now, we are witnessing a state of a high level of immorality worldwide, particularly in the United States, which was founded on Christian-based values, the Judeo-Christian-based values. Now, there are lots of people who are suggesting that it is going to be the first step towards a national Sunday law, or the first step towards the union of church and state. Now, there is a lot of misunderstanding of what we mean by the union of church and state, or the separation of church and state. People tend to think that the separation of church and state means that God does not exist in the nation. His name should not even be called. Because if his name is called, then that is a union of state and church. But is that what the founding fathers meant when they say that, you know, you know, they, there should be a separation of church and state? Well, that is not said in the Constitution, but we have record of Jefferson saying that among other founding fathers, all right, who says that, you know, um, the, it's best if Americans, you know, separate church and state. Now, in the book of the Bible, Psalm 33, verse 12, it says here in the New International Version, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Uh, look at New Living Version. The New Living Version translation says, uh, what joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people he has chosen as is his inheritance. Well, yes, some people might argue that he was referring to the Jews, but so often God has challenged and has dispensed his judgment upon nations who have not followed him. And we have the issue of Solomon Gomorrah. We have the issue of Nineveh. And Solomon Gomorrah, we could not say were Jews, were they? No, they were not God's chosen people, but they were a nation um, and they had accumulated a lot of evil deeds and God had to intervene and he destroyed them. So the warning had to be given 
right? And the warning was given by Lot, right? That they should repent among other people that God had had amongst these people, that what they were doing was evil before the Lord and he was going to destroy them. Now, the United States is not a Christian nation. Let's be very clear on that. But it is a Christian-based nation. Its entire political, uh, cultural, legal systems were based on Judeo, the concept of the Judeo um, principles um, that we find, the Judeo-Christian principles that we find in the Bible, right? So we're not here suggesting that we should merge or we should unite church and state. What we are here suggesting is God cannot be distanced from the culture because when we distance God from the culture, then we are going to have, of course, the onslaught of immorality, all sides of immorality that we are seeing that the political left is actually introducing into our schools. Now, let me say here, first of all, that I am not particularly, um, I am apolitical. <laughs> I follow politics because I want to be able to look at what the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation particularly have to say about politics. So I'm, I like current events. I like to speak about political affairs and to connect the dots between what the Bible has said and what we're seeing happening before our very eyes, right? So I, in terms of that, I am passionate I am a passionate follower, as it were, of politics and of prophecy, right? These two P words. But I must say that I am anti the union of church and state. I What I am not sure, as many people are suggesting, is if we should just take God out, totally out of the picture, because that is our impression of the separation of church and state. I don't believe so, because even the Declaration of Independence that was written by men who were not actually avid Christians, right? The founding fathers were not particularly saying that they were attached to any particular religion, right? Even though they preferred, they understood that where you had the biblical culture that were based on biblical principles, they understood that those cultures tended to be more stable, right? And much more prosperous. And there are lots of research, including going dating way back from the 18th and previous uh, centuries in which, um, you know, sociologists have outlined that the cultures that were tethered to the Protestant philosophy, right, the, the Protestant way of, you know, um, indoctrination and the, the Protestant uh, political machinery, and just, you know, about the cultural lifestyle that they tended to be much more prosperous nations than countries that were Catholic, right? Or countries that were atheistic or countries that belonged to other religious affiliations like Muslims or the Hindus, et cetera, et cetera, right? And we can see that in the West, that the West over the years tended to have been much more prosperous. We can see that also in the lives of the Jews before they rejected Christ, that their culture was also very prosperous, right? They had a very prosperous and um, high level culture, what we call a high culture, right? Their culture was not inferior by any stretch of the imagination, right? Because God blessed them. And that's why the Lord says that blessed is the nation whose uh, God is the Lord, right? So the founding fathers in the constitution said that, you know, all men are created by their creator and creator there means God. Now, what the founding fathers did not want to happen as was happening in Europe, in England, in Spain, in France, and other different countries, was that there would have been a state religion. So let's say, for example, in England, where you have the Church of England being the state religion. So among all the Christian faiths that you have in Europe, in England, for example, the Anglican Church is what predominates because it is considered to be the head of state right, the, the church state, right, the church that governs the political machinery. Now, that is not what the United States wanted, or the Catholic church, as we see in Spain, in France, in Latin America, in countries like the Dominican Republic, in Colombia, and all over Latin America, in Mexico, we can see where the Catholic church runs the show, right, and the political leaders 
have to submit themselves to the ideologies, right, and the leadership of the Roman Catholic papacy. That is not what the founding fathers of the United States wanted, because we know that you have a lot of different representatives, different church representatives, uh, or representations, I should say, of the Protestant um, doctrines and Protestant churches in America. So you have the Baptists, you have the Anglicans, you have the Presbyterians, you have the Methodists, et cetera, et cetera. Well, well the, the, the Presbyterians are known as the Methodists and um, among other, you know, the Seventh-day Adventists, among other Protestant denominations or evangelicals as we call them today. Now, the, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only Protestant denomination that exists in Christendom. And if people understand the true meaning of what Protestantism means, they'll understand that many of these other churches are not protesting against the Catholic because Protestants means some, the church that was protesting against the Catholic movement, they then saw that the beast of Revelation was the Roman Catholic papacy. So that is very clear, and we can't get into that right now, right? Because there's a, that's another lesson, that's another video that we'd have to make, another series of videos, because it's very complex and nuanced and textured. The problem is that the United States now, because of its indoctrination, this political left indoctrinating the school system for so many years, I think that even among Christians, we do not have a, a great understanding, a clear understanding of what God meant when he says separation of church and state, right? So we think that separation of church and state includes that we do not teach, for example, religion in school. Well, that is not true, right? There's nothing wrong if you read the Bible in schools, and you pray in schools. That is not the union of church and state, right? The problem is if in the school system, you're actually foisting your particular brand of the Christian religion onto your students. So let's say that you belong to Jehovah's Witnesses or you belong to the Seventh Adventist Church or Baptist or Presbyterian Church. If you are trying to indoctrinate the students into the ideology, right, and proselytizing them, then something is wrong with that. But if you're just reading the Bible, appreciating it, looking at the stories of the Bible, right, having students learn the Ten Commandments, which are the hallmark of morality in any society. And that is why we're having our politicians stealing, including our civilians too, stealing and killing, and they do not feel a sense of guilt, right, because the Ten Commandments are not written in our hearts. And if the Ten Commandments are not written on our hearts, then our societies are not going to be prosperous. Right? We're seeing the manifestations of a lack of God's laws written on our hearts. Doesn't mean, therefore, that that is when we go into government or when we, if we're a teacher, I am a Seventh-day Adventist, for example. If I were reading the Bible in school, it is not my right to go and have a crusade and tell a person who is Methodist or Baptist that they should not worship on Sunday. But if, the, if, the, if, if I come to a biblical truth and I present it to them, I can present it to them by saying, this is what I understand by what the Bible says. But you might have a different opinion. Now, if the student is interested and is desirous of digging deeper, delving deeper into what the Sabbath issue is all about, then yeah, more power to that student. But it's not for me to always go and say, well, the Seventh-day Adventist church is the superior church, right? And is the church of God. That is not the place for that, right? The church is a place for that. From a religious, when I go to church, I can say that, right? Because that is the platform of the church. But as a teacher, it is not the platform, or if I'm in politics, it's not my political platform to stand up there. You know, let us say that I was a Ben Carson and I was in Trump's uh, administration or in Biden's administration, as a matter of fact. It's not my, um, unless I'm asked to do so, it's not the platform from which I would say that the Seventh-day Adventist movement is a correct church, it's a right church, it's God's true church, right? That's not where, that's not the place where that should be done. However, to suggest 
that I cannot pray at, for example, at a political meeting, a political campaign, right, or at school, then that is just ridiculous, right? And I don't think that that is a union of church and state. I've also given an example. The Let us look at the Anglo-Caribbean. Let us look at Jamaica as, you know, we can say that Jamaica has a lot of problems and it does have a lot of problems. But one of the things that if you go down there that people will see is that there is a vibrant religious liberty. There is the whole matter of religious liberty is really alive and well there, right? People are free to be, what to practice whatever religion that they want to practice. However, in that system, in the Jamaican system, along with other Anglo-speaking Caribbean, I can only attest to the Anglo-speaking Caribbean in Trinidad, in the Dominica, right? In perhaps also in Guyana, a South American country, we have religious education in our school system. And that system allows us to look at Christianity. It allows religious education, allows us to look at Hinduism, allows us to look at just about all the religions of the world, right? But we mainly focus on the Bible, the religion of the Bible. And you have people there, teachers who have been Methodist, teachers who have been Anglican, teachers who are Baptist, right? And they're not there proselytizing the children, right? They are there to teach the Bible. And there are certain stories like the, like the story of Abraham and Moses and all of these characters. We learned, if you're not learning them at home, you learn them in school, right? And if you learn them at home, it's being reinforced in school. I don't think anything is wrong with that. And I think that in the United States, uh, for many years, the Bible was a major text. Right? And the Bible should still be a major text because, after all, the United States was founded based on Christian values and Christian principles. The history is there. The reason why it was founded was that they were fleeing religious persecution. Right, And remember now that we talk about where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Right, So if, there, if the students are going to be exposed to the Ten Commandments, what problem can there be when our schools are one of the most immoral places that we can ever go to right now, right? A hot spot of immorality. Now, if the Ten Commandments are being placed, I think it's a great opportunity for our students to be exposed and to come to some knowledge of what these commandments are. I had read something, and I'm not sure I'm able to pull up that right now, about the number of students who are actually aware of the, let me see if it's in the Christian Monitor. Uh, please give me a few seconds. I might be able to pull up this um, piece that I had read. Okay, so we have the Ten Commandments and the, and the society. Let me see if this is where I read it. Yeah. Look at what it says here. This is, a, this is an article that was written in the Ten Commandments and Foundation of American Society. And it was written by, uh, is it Kenan uh, Curton, right? Kenan Curton, that's the name I'm seeing here. And it's coming from the frc.org booklet. Here's what he says. For a majority of Americans, the Ten Commandments are not set in stone. According to a USA Today poll, now this is a USA Today poll, 60% of Americans cannot name five of the Ten Commandments. Let me repeat that. 60% of Americans cannot right, name five of the Ten Commandments. In fact, it is amazing that Americans do not know by comparison. And listen to what he's saying here. 74% of Americans can name all three stooges, Mo, Larry, and Curly. 35% of Americans can recall all six kids from the Brady Bunch. 25% of Americans can name all seven ingredients of McDonald's Big Mac. 25% of Americans can name all seven ingredients of McDonald's Big Mac. 
here is the sad news, and this is what he continues to say. Only 14% can accurately name all 10 commandments. Only in America, a country that was founded on religious principles, on the Judeo-Christian principles, only 14% of the population can accurately name all 10 commandments. Yet 78% of Americans are in favor of public displays of the commandments. All right, so how ironic, he says. Americans affirm the Ten Commandments, but cannot name them. Right, And this is what you know we should be talking about, that it should not just be just putting up the Ten Commandments in school, but that we should ensure that Americans read them, memorize them, and try also to put them into practice, right? That they, we can have a healthier society. Because we know that wherever the Ten Commandments are practiced, or whenever they're practiced, we know that our society will become less immoral because we have an immoral society. And there is just utter chaos in the American educational system as we know it right now. It is chaos. It has been chaotic for many decades, for many years. And there was an article written some years ago that I read coming from, I think it was from Ireland, you know, and Ireland is a part of the West. And this author was acknowledging the fact that while when students were more attuned to reading the Bible, when, when it was customary, when it was a part, when, when it was deeply embedded in the culture to read the Bible, that literacy rates were higher. In fact, he says that literacy, literacy rates in the West, including the United States, has faltered, has been faltering, has been falling for so many years. And he was actually ascribing it to the low literacy that we have in the Bible, right? Remember now that it was the Bible that revolutionized the rates of literacy in the West. Right? The West was largely, before the Bible was printed, illiterate. Right, And as a result of the reading of its pages, that we had the level of literacy that we saw, and we have, well, we have remnants of it um, right now in our societies. But let me say something here, too. When you look at a, well, um, former American, the former Americans, you know, Americans in in the colonial times and, and afterwards, maybe up to the 20th century. Um, let us look, for example, at W. E. Du Bois. And W. E. Du Bois wrote his book, Black Reconstruction, which spoke about slavery. And in every chapter, he had a biblical, uh, you know, it's like a biblical theme, was like a thematic book, and he centered slavery around the whole teaching of the Bible, right? While giving a left-wing perspective, if you understand me, and quoting a scripture from the Bible, right? Because it showed you that people in that time, in, in I, I, don't, I don't want to say ancient America, right? But in more ancient times, I should say, they were more attuned and aware of and knowledgeable of the, the Bible and the stories in the Bible, and their language was so much more refined. I don't think that we are writing as these people used to write. And people have been saying that there is a correlation between frequent reading of the Bible and your ability to write, not only in English, but in other of the languages that the Bible is written in. The Bible is the word of God. Right? And the Bible says in his word that his word shall not return unto him void. Right, It shall accomplish what it will. Now, we know that there is an agenda. That is very clear. And as Adventists, we know that you know, they're trying to push for a Sunday law. Eventually, they will. But we cannot also ignore the fact that we're living in a moral society. And whatever we can do until Christ comes and to win souls for God, we cannot just sometimes limit the methods, you know, God to a particular human methods of, you know, of spreading the message, right? If we, for example, put up the Ten Commandments, we should not force it onto our students. 
but it should be there, right, as a reminder that our society, that the Western societies were built on solid Judeo-Christian principles. Whether they accept it or not, it will be made known to them, right? And on the Day of Judgment, it will be a testament that they saw and they rejected, right? So a lot of times we're moving on to proselytizing countries like India and China and other countries when America right now is a pagan society. It is no longer a Christian-based society, right? With a Christian-based culture. It is a paganized culture because we have moved away from the principles of the Bible and we're moving into accepting humanistic values, value systems that have been created by human beings who are telling us that they can reorder a society without God. That's essentially what humanism is about, that our society can be ordered, can be refashioned, can be remodeled without God because God is not intelligent as men are. That's a nutshell. That's a nutshell of this humanism, humanism, this humanistic understanding of reality. And how are these trends affecting our society? Right? So are we when we talk about when we see the MSNBCs and the CNNs, you know, going ballistic, they're going ballistic about the Ten Commandments and how it's going to impinge on our religious liberties. Were they not living in 2021 when all these mandates were foisted upon the people? What were they saying about it? Are they not living in this woke, you know, this world of woke, is it? In which we're talking about a man is not a man and a woman is not a woman and all of this depends on our understanding and it depends on, you know, on our realities, we don't we no longer have objective realities, right? Or everything depends on how you think. Your truth is your truth, right? That is what they're teaching us right now, and that's not coming from the Bible, because the Bible said you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So if you don't know the truth, you are a slave, right? You are a slave, no matter how many degrees you you would have had or you have garnered. Right? You are a slave. That is what you've got to understand. So the whole matter of separation of church and state does not mean, therefore, that God's word is going to be cast out. In fact, it should be the center. But what should not happen is that we should not foist our denominational doctrines onto the state and say that the state should become Seventh-day Adventists and they should all become Sabbatarians and they should all acknowledge the Sabbath. You know, that is not what the church, the state is about, right? But the state on this should understand that God's moral laws are the laws that will uphold and will, you know, glue citizens and, you know, will make a culture prosperous and become a, a what should I say now, an example of what God wants a society to be. It will not be uh, perfect because as we can understand, during the days when Americans read the Bible a lot, right? And they were more knowledgeable of the Bible, we had slavery. That's the irony of it, right? <laughs> you know, the time when they were more knowledgeable of the Bible, right? They came and they practiced slavery for years, right? For years. However, it was the same now. Now, the people who practiced slavery were the ones who were hypocritical, right? And they were the pseudo-Christians, as it were. But, thanks be to God, the true Christians stood up, including many people among in the Seventh-day Adventist movement at the time. They stood up against slavery, and they spoke out against slavery, right? And that is how we had an ending to that system. The total, the complete abolition of that system in America, as it were, right? Without the Bible and without the Christian belief system, slavery would have been intact in America right now as we speak, because there was absolutely no, the science didn't back, backed up slavery. 
right? Did not defend the slaves. The science actually supported slavery through the system of evolution. And by the way, as I told you before on this, on this platform in my show, that the theory of evolution came out just Charles Darwin evolution of theory was published there about in the 1860s, 1859, I think, just before the Civil War. And that was what um, the president of the the um the southern what they call the southerners now they are uh, what's what were they called again <laughs> i forgot the name of those people in the south right the those people who were warring against the north right but the southerners right they used that system right or the theory actually not the system but the theory of evolution as their major platform as their major thesis to defend slavery right they used it as their major thesis, the theory of evolution, because it's just that we suggest that we have evolved, human beings evolved, and we started, black people started from the monkeys, and you know, other races evolved, and whites or Europeans were at the top. Right? So they should have the legal rights to, you know, keep black people in slavery. So it was a knowledge of the Bible. Right, a truthful understanding of its teachings and its principles, right, that brought about the abolition, the ending of slavery. Right. So if we have a society in which men, the majority of us, we those of us who are in the church still, we should be happy. We take it for granted that people know basic stories and they understand basic principles, but they don't. Right? And that is why we have the immorality that we're seeing right now. And if it continues, we won't be able to live in our homes. right? And if we are indoctrinating already, the political left is indoctrinating uh, an army of children to accept this humanistic understanding of life and to say that God does not matter. All you have to do is to live your life the way how you want to live it you know, be free and do anything. There's There should be no restrictions on what you want to do. This libertarian um, understanding of life, just do whatever you want to do. Do that which makes you happy. And don't be concerned about the circumstances and the consequences of your actions, right? That's essentially what our students are learning in school right now. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible understands that we, 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 you have to, your actions have to be responsible, right? And you cannot, your actions come with consequences. We make choices, but our choices come with consequences. And God's way is the best way. There, there is no other way because he is all knowing and because he's all knowing, right? And he, um, is all powerful, he's able to see everything and to know that he instructs us not to walk on a certain path. And if we walk on the wrong path, then it's going to lead to destruction, right? And America, as we know, and the West in, 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 in general, are at this point on a road of destruction. And our children are being indoctrinated into the wrong things, right? They're not learning the knowledge that they should learn. So I think that if they see the Ten Commandments on in their classrooms, right, God will speak to their hearts. The Bible says that his word shall not return unto him void. Right? They will not return unto him void. So it means, therefore, that we cannot limit God's way of doing things. Yes, we understand that gender. And we should, from the uh, from a church platform, begin to speak the agenda. But better yet, if you know, when the child goes home, and if let us say he turns on his TV to, or or his YouTube channel to somebody who is explicating, um, what then the real agenda is, then he will come to he will have an understanding and a, a better appreciation of the Bible. Right, but many of our children do not know any. Thing about the Bible. They don't even know the Bible stories. And I must say, not only the children, but their parents also are not knowledgeable 
about the Bible. We take the Bible as some, it's a joke, right? It's the, a lesser book to the books that we're reading in the classroom, not understanding that the Bible is superior than all the books in the world combined. All the books, the major books in the world combined, right? And this is something that we've got to understand and we've got to preach, right? But I'm saying now that as a teacher, and I'm a teacher, my responsibility is not to go to school and speak like that and speak like I'm speaking now, right? Because that should not be tolerated. We should have a, we should not have a union of church and state, right? But a union of church and state does not mean, therefore, <laughs> that God, not having a union of church and state does not mean, for, mean, therefore, rather, that God cannot be mentioned, that his name cannot be acknowledged, right? That we cannot have a reading, right? An appreciation of the Bible, reading the stories of the Bible, discussing them and making comparisons and contrasts between what happened then in biblical times and what is happening now in our societies. Nothing is wrong with that, right? We're reading other literary texts and some of these literary texts are coming from other cultures that have different religions, right? And people in the public school systems are learning about other religions. They're learning about the Hindu, about Hinduism. They're learning about the Muslim, the Islam, Islamic religion, you know, and all of that. They're learning these things and they're learning about this human, humanism and humanism is a religion. Atheism is a religion, right? And that is the religion of the political left. You're going to say, wow, how is atheism a religion? Because being atheistic means that you're not, you don't believe in God. But you have your own God. You have created your own God. And the result of that, that is your God. So if your God is your politicians, which sometimes your gods are your politicians, you know, that's, you know, Biden or Trump, right? Or all the politicians, you've made them into your own gods. Or your job might be your God. Or the philosophies that you study. Or the philosophers like Karl Marx and these people might be your God, and rightly so. So there is no athe there is no atheistic person per se, right? There is no atheistic person. That is not true, right? All of us worship some form of God, but we should aim toward worshiping a God of heaven who is the right God. And let me repeat it. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, right? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, right? Now, there is a, uh, you know, uh, an interview that was done between Matt Michael Martin and Matt Frauds, and they were talking about the whole Ten Commandments being placed in classrooms in Louisiana. And a question was asked him. Let me see if I can share this with you. Um, yeah, let me let me open, let me share the screen and just for you to see what this interview was. It's it was published in NPR, right? So it is not a conspiracy theory newspaper, as you like to suggest, right? NPR, right? Is what you normally read, right? Because you think that newspapers are what gives you the gospel truth. So let me share my screen with you and see if we can read this um, question and answer. I thought it was an, an interesting question and the, the guy, the guest answered him quite well. Um, here what Martin is at, he's the interviewer. I understand that, but there are also people who, who adhere to other religious traditions that do not include the Ten Commandments. Is it not a concern that the children who are also paying, whose parents are also paying taxes, feel equally included when they are in public school classrooms? Is that not a concern at all? And this is what the guest is answering. I think his answers were very good. I don't think that that's as much of a concern. Again, up until 1980, I don't think there were a lot of students or parents clamoring that they were being forced to proselytize or being proselytized by the mere fact of having the Ten Commandments on the walls. So before the night of before 1918, the Ten Commandments, just like the Bible in 1950s and before, were permitted to be read 
in school, the Bible was permitted to be read there. But I would say that there is an opportunity for kids, especially in today's culture, to look at those principles. Don't kill, don't steal, honor your father and mother, don't be greedy, don't envy, and that's actually a good reminder for our students. So I don't think that there is a coercive effect. I don't think that there is a proselytizing effect. And the question is asked, so okay, but what if they think there is? And Cross' response is, I think it's just a good reminder of the principles and values, especially the legal, educational, and cultural principles that our country was built upon. That's always a good thing to remind students. We cannot forget a knowledge or history of where we're coming from as a people, right? Now, Martin asks question here, okay, and what if students today do feel that they're being coerced by this? What do you say to them as if they're not being coerced by left-wing ideologies also? What if you say to parents who come from, say, different countries like India, for example, or whatever, pick a country where that is not part of the religious tradition, and they say that they do feel it's coercive, what would your response to them be as a person who also has been an elected official as well as legal counsel? What would you say? Liked his response. I would tell them, hey, we're so glad that you are here in our country. Yeah, because if you go to India, you're not going to be respected. You just have to do what, you know, the Joneses do, right? They're not going to tell you that you have, you know, all of this freedom to do, you know. So, and I'm not saying... Freedom does not mean that you do whatever you want to do. You have to respect the home to, you know, um, that you end up in, right? I can't go to people's house and begin to put my shoes, you know, wherever I want to put it, even though I'm not a slave in their homes, right? They have their rules there and I have to follow their rules, right? Andrew, this is where you put your shoes. Andrew, this is where you put your jacket, right? This is time we eat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? You can't run the show when you go into people's homes and the country belong to the people who live there, right? And they have rules and they have cultural norms and practices and principles and values. We want you to know where our country came from and you cannot. It's inescapable that the 10 commandments were a very important part of the founding of the country. You go to the US Supreme Court building and you see Moses, you see the 10 commandments of the walls. And so again, I think it's a great historical lesson or opportunity to tell these. Absolutely. Right? We can't have people be, you know, offended at everything. Right? It is what it is. You go to a country and they have certain, once they're not actually telling you that you have to give up your own Hinduism, and which America does not do, right? People go there with their different religions and they are able to practice them. Right? They have their temples and you know and 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 all the sacred places of worship. Right? And that is what America is all about. But it's about the fact also that America was founded on what? Judeo-Christian principles and, and attitudes and values, right? And Americans cannot negate that. The moment they negate that, which they have been negating that, which they have been refuting that, which they have been repudiating that, then you're going to see a collapse. And we're seeing a rapid collapse in what we know or what we knew as American values or the American society. It is rapidly collapsing right before our eyes. Right before our eyes. Right? And we know what why it's collapsing but people you know can't speak out because they feel that they are going to offend their neighbors and they're going to feel that they're preaching you know this gospel to their neighbors but as i'm suggesting here the separation of church and state does not mean that god cannot be mentioned that prayer cannot be done right and that you cannot acknowledge the God of heaven. You can. What you should not do, as God would not accept that, is to foist your belief system, your denominational understanding. But America is a Christian-based society. And if the Muslims go there, if the Jews go there, if the Hindus go there, they just have to understand that. 
that they're not going to be calling down the gods of of Hindu, the Hindu gods or the Muslim gods or whatever gods that other people serve and worship, right? That is not the god that people are going to call um, on in the United States or should call on, I should say, because I think that they're doing, they're calling on them right now because of the shift, the cultural values have shifted over the years because of this political left orientation and indoctrination. So both sides are wrong if the political right in placing the commandments in school will eventually foist and coerce students to do whatever they want and to think in that religious mode that they want them to think in, that is going to be wrong. But to expose them to the Ten Commandments and to let the commandments be known, nothing is wrong with that because it is a seed planted in the hearts of our children. Let me repeat that. It is a seed. The Ten Commandments are seeds, right? That are going to be planted in the hearts of men. Now, some of the children will re reject it, right? And it's fine because it is their right to reject it, right? Because God gives every man freedom of choice, freedom of expression, and freedom to exercise your will, right? Consequences will follow, but you have that freedom of choice. But let our children be exposed to the Ten Commandments, and it might spark an interest in wanting to read the Bible entirely and to be converted and to become a citizen of our future home, which is heaven. So please, let's not now begin to throw out the baby with the bathwater and suggest that a separation of church and state means therefore that Bible reading cannot be done in school, cannot be studied in school, and that we cannot have the Ten Commandments in our school system. That is not true, right? That is not true. We should be having a complete debate, right, in the schools about where we came from and how the Christian base, the Judeo-Christian principles on which the nation was founded, right? How those principles have or are being thrown out, right? They're being thrown out at the moment, right? The baby is being thrown out with the bath water. And how the replacement, right, of this, you know, left-wing humanistic philosophy or philosophies are now being used to indoctrinate our children into refashioning a society that is about to collapse in front of our eyes, right? We have to wake up. Let's stop propagating nonsense and let's not put God into our narrow way of doing things. God has in his people in high places, right? And I know that sometimes some people are calling out Ben Carson. They're saying that Ben Carson, what is he doing? And you know, has he lost his way? But in terms of, I agree with them on this occasion, and nothing is wrong to have the Ten Commandments put up in our classrooms. Absolutely nothing is wrong with that, right? Because as I'm saying, these are seeds, right? Planted in the hearts and planted in the hearts of children. And that will help them to make, they will not necessarily follow them and they don't. But I also do not agree if the state should withhold, just like you have the members of the political left do, but the political left practice the same thing. They withhold funding, let us say, if you do not agree with the ideology of gender dysphoria or this transgender agenda, then they begin to withhold state funding from the school. That should not be. And no state should coerce students to our teachers, as a matter of fact, or the administrators to follow in the line of the Christian understanding of the Christian worldview, right? They should not. And if they're doing that, then that's, that, that's the time we should call them out, right? But we can't call them out until they begin to do that, right? We know that the Ten Commandments are healthy, right? And they are the moral code of any society, even the societies which are atheistic, right? This is God's moral code for mankind. So nothing can be wrong 
nothing under the sun can be wrong if they are placed in the classrooms of America's public school system. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you'll share and you'll subscribe and you'll like this video so that the videos or this video particularly will be shared on the platform so that others can engage with the content. Thank you so much for joining. We'll see you in another video. Adios.